morning, everybody. My name is Ingrid Keller. I'm the head of unit of the Health Security Unit in the Directorate General for Health and Food Safety of the European Commission. And then I would like to really very warmly welcome to this session on the future of health threats preparedness in the part as part of the European Health Forum of Gastein 2021, an online session with the hope that next year we all may meet again physically in Gaststein. I would like to invite all the participants to uh, take part in a Slido exercise. We would like to build a word cloud with you. Here you have a QR, QR code. If you scan this, it will immediately lead you to the Gaststein page of Slido and then you could participate in this exercise. We would like to have one word from you when you think about this question, what should be the key aims of post-COVID-19 European pandemic preparedness? And we will build this word cloud over the good first 40, 45 minutes of the session. So um, please feel free to continue to participate also when the first speakers are um, giving their, their presentations. So I see the exercise works. Equity is very big and prominently in the middle. Thank you so much for your active participation. And while you are doing this, I will now um, introduce the speakers to you. I'm very pleased that we could put a, a very distinguished panel together for you this morning. Um, we have as a first speaker, Pierre Delso, who is the Deputy Director General of DG Sante and also Acting Director for the new Directorate uh, for HERA, the Health Emergency and Response Authority. We also have Ima Cook, the Director of the European Medicines Agency, Andrea Amon, the director of the European Center for Disease Prevention and Control, Antoine Schwörer from the French Ministry of Solidarity and Health, Barbara Kerstiens, deputy director from the European Commission's Research and Innovation Directorate, and also Moitza Gobic from the Ministry of Health of the Republic of Slovenia. So the session is structured is in, in several parts. Um, we will have Pierre Dessault, I will invite him in a minute to be the first speaker to really set the scene. And then um, the colleagues from the agencies and also the uh, Director General for Research and Innovation are uh, invited to, to react and share their uh, point of view. And then we will take a short break in terms of the um, speakers and go to the newsroom, go to you, to the participants and the attendees, because you can actively participate via the Q&A part in the chat function. So we would certainly also like to hear from you what you think, what are your ideas, what are your questions. Please feel, feel free to, to contribute. Um, and then as a second part in the session, I will invite Antoine and also Moitza to share their views as Moita as the current EU presidency and Antoine as the incoming presidency. Um, after those interventions, it will be again the turn of the attendees to ask questions and um, the panel will then be tasked to ask, answer the questions to you um, in, at, uh, in, uh, orally. And we will uh, finalize the session with a take home tweet for you, for the attendees from the panelists. So I see that the number of attendees is constantly rising. We have nearly made it to 70 now. Um, that is great. Thank you so much for uh, your interest in our session. And um, then without further ado, I would like to hand over and give the floor to Pierre Delso, who, as I said before, is the Deputy Director General here in the European Commission for the Directorate General 
for health and food safety, and also an act, the acting director general for the new health emergency and response authority. Thank you so much, Pia, for agreeing to join us this morning. You have the floor, please go ahead. Thank you very much, Ingrid, and good morning to everybody. As you said, probably it would be better to be in Gastein, all of us together, rather than being spread around Europe. But at least apparently we have, you know, we are united in one aspect. The weather is bad everywhere. So you know, we have a gray rain everywhere. But probably I would prefer to, to look at the mountain rather than looking at the buildings or in Brussels. But anyway, let's try to make this a, a very interesting session. And I love the title because the title is looking at the future of what we should do, you know, to try to improve the situation. But of course, if you want to talk about the future, first you need to look at the past. And the past, of course, is a COVID crisis in which, unfortunately, it's not completely a past because we are still in this COVID crisis. But we need also to try to learn the lesson from this COVID crisis. And the first message I would like to convey to you is a very simple one. You know, in Europe, always, we have a tendency to believe that everything is better outside of Europe. You know, the rest of the world is always doing better than what we do. Actually, we should be proud of what we have achieved, all of us together. You know, the fact that so many people are being vaccinated in Europe, the fact that we've been able to, to react so fast, all of us together, is quite impressive. And of course, in this context, I would like to, to thank Emma and of course, her colleagues, uh, I would like to thank Andrea and also her colleagues and my colleagues from the Commission for the really impressive work which has been done in combination with the member state, in combination with industry. That was United Europe working together to try to, to be able to address the COVID crisis. But of course, let's also be honest, we realized, and especially at the beginning of the crisis, that we were not ready, we were not prepared for this. And so it's clear that we need also to draw the lesson from this experience, and we need to be better prepared for future crises. Because if there is one thing which is sure, one day, I don't know when, of course, but one day there will be a new health crisis. And we need to anticipate this. We need to be better ready for this uh, future health crisis. So what if we do, where are we now on, uh, at the commission level and the EU level? Because also that was one of the key messages of the COVID crisis. You know, isolated response by member states are not sufficient. We need to do something at EU level. We need to work together. So that's why, as you know, the Commission has tabled ambitious proposal for a European Health Union, and where, where we have, you know, the cross-border health threat legislative proposal, and we want also to reinforce the mandates of ECDC and EMA. Because we believe, I, I said, they play a very important role in the, in the crisis, but we need the mandates to be uh, reinforced. We are now negotiating those texts. So we are getting close to the final text, I hope. Uh, and I count on the Slovenian presidency to be able to deliver on those three ambitious proposals. I'm not going to enter into the detail of those proposals because I know that Emer and Andrea will are part of this panel. And I suppose they will explain a little bit more the details of what we want to do. But let's be clear, we need strong ECDC and strong EMA in the future if we really want to be pre prepared. But I would like to focus more on HERA, which is a novelty, I would say, that you have mentioned. And as you know, HERA has been proposed as a package very recently. Just for those who have not followed all the details, HERA is actually an authority that we create immediately. And in the same time, we have made a legislative proposal for legislation to give extra powers to HERA when we'll be faced again with a crisis. But let me try to give you a broad picture of this so you can follow this because I believe it's a little bit, uh, might be a little bit complicated. So HERA will be, will have a specific uh, focus on medical countermeasures, namely vaccines, antibiotics, antitoxin, chemical antidotes, therapeutics, and so on. So the main role of HERA will be to coordinate and support the development, procurement, and distribution of critical countermeasures at EU level. And again, as I already said it, ERA will have actually two types of uh, functioning. The first one will be, you know, what I would call in peacetime, when we are not in a crisis mode, but we need to prepare us for future crises. And then the second mode of ERA will be when there is a crisis which has been declared at the European level to just organize swift and effective strategic response during health emergency. So how do we want to achieve this? 
we did not want to create a new agency. Why? And I know there, there was a lot of comments and criticism on this, but the point is the following. First of all, if you want to create a new agency, it takes time. It's not something you can do overnight. You need a legislative proposal. You need, you need a lot of time to make, it, uh, to make it ready. And you know, you have sometimes discussions which may sound uh, important, but still, are they really important? Or for instance, where do you put this new agency? You know, in which places do you put it? So we didn't want to have an agency because it was too slow. But we have also a very important reason why we wanted uh, ERA to be established already now, as the 1st of October, so just in uh, two days from now. In simply, because we want ERA to be operational as soon as possible, but also to have appropriate financial, technical, and also staff resources available. And so we have decided to create ERA as part of the commission. But because be, being part of the commission, ERA will benefit actually from all the staff resources of the commission. So clearly the idea would be to move posts from other parts of the commission and to allocate them to ERA. And this can be done extremely quickly. And we need, of course, to recruit people to fill in those posts. And by the way, if I can make an offer, we don't want only to recruit officials because we know that you, we need expertise coming from the outside. So we really want to recruit national experts, but also temporary agents coming from the you know, outside of the commission because we know we need to build this expertise. But again, by having ERA as an internal service, it's possible to move fast and to have this possibility to have the posts which are already there immediately. Second important element for us why creating ERA as a, you know, as a central service of, the, as a service of the commission is the fact that ERA will then have access to programs such as eu 4 l Rescue Europe, uh, Rescue EU, sorry, and Horizon Europe. And we have been able to set aside a budget of 6 billion euros for the next six years, so 1 billion a year for ERA activities. And this is, of course, what I call in peacetime. Besides this specific budget, which will be managed to a certain extent by ERA, and let me come back to this because I know there is a lot of misunderstanding on this. Uh, we also, ERA will be able also to have an input on money managed by other funds, like you know the Recovery and Resilience Fund or the Cohesion Fund. And so we estimate that the money that to which ERA will be able to have an access indirectly it's about 24 billion euro for the next six years. And if you add also the 20 billion that we estimate member states will dedicate to the preparedness in Europe, it means that actually Europe as a whole, Team Europe, to use the wording of the president of the commission, will be able to manage around 50 billion of euro in peacetime to, uh, to be ready for the next crisis. And again, I insist on the fact of peacetime because being part of the commission, it's clear also that ERA, in, in case of a crisis, will be able to mobilize much more money like we have done in the current crisis. So this is quite impressive and quite important. Now, when I say that 6 billion will be managed by ERA, that's true and not completely true, because we will use the existing programs. And so it means simply that, as for instance, if I take eu 4 l part of eu 4 l will be dedicated to actions in the context of ERA but it will be using this legislative framework. So we believe this is a very efficient way to create immediately a new authority, which will be there now, operational very quickly with the appropriate resources and getting access to the, to the different budget which are needed. I would like also to insist on one very important point. We don't want HERA to duplicate the work of EMA or ECDC. As I said, on the contrary, we want to reinforce ECDC, we want to reinforce EMA. And so ERA will be there to complement the work which is already done and will continue to be done even more in the future by EMA and ERA, and sorry, ECDC. And then again, when I, heard, when I hear this debate about why do we need ERA in Europe and so on, look at the US. They have you know, FDA, they have CDC, they have BARDA, and actually now they want even to create a new authority which will coordinate everything. So I don't see why the US have come up to that solution and why it's impossible to do it in Europe. So I'm sure knowing Emma and knowing Andrea that the cooperation between uh, the three of us will be excellent and will continue to be excellent because it's exactly what we need. And of course, we will have to, to make sure that we know exactly who, uh, who is doing what under which condition, but I have no problem we will be able to do it. Now, if I look at ERA activities, and I will conclude on this because I've been asked to be very short, uh, 
you know, we will, the idea is basically to do from end to end. So what does it mean? You know, the first mission would be to try to assess health threats, you know, future health, health threats, which might emerge. That would be the initial step. Once we, you know, and of course, for that, we will need, as I say, cooperation of external players, because again, we don't want also to look, to look only on Europe. The international dimension is important. Then, of course, we will have to promote research and development. And my colleague Barbara will talk about it. But of course, this is a very important part. If we identify the threat, we need to get ready to try to be ready for this. We will have also to try to address market challenges and failures to make sure that we have the critical technologies which are there. And we need also to ensure the provision of medical countermeasures. For instance, joint procurement would, could be a tool. Stockpiling could be another tool. Or also what we know, uh, EU FAP, you know, which is having ever warm capabilities, production capabilities, which will be there in case needed if there is a crisis. So again, I believe ERA is a very important element, a very important piece of the puzzle. It's not going to replace EMA, it's not going to replace the CDC. But by working all of us together with all at EU level, with the member states, with industry, with stakeholders, we want simply to build the systems in which we will be ready for the next crisis. And I hope I will never see a new crisis, but we need to be ready for the worst case scenario. And that's what we want to do. Thank you very much for your attention, for your attention and I look forward to the possible question. Thank you very much, Pierre, for uh, your intervention and also for clearly explaining again the, the aims and the role of, of HERA, but also for sharing the positive message with, uh, with us. And I think you're right, we should be proud of uh, seeing of what we have achieved. I mean, having more than 70% of the population uh, vaccinated is, is clearly a big achievement in, in Europe. But as you said, it's also time to take stock and see that the isolated approach did not really work. So maybe I could ask the colleagues from Gastein to pull out our work cloud that we are building. Um, and I don't know, Pierre, would you have an immediate reaction if you see this word cloud? When I see this, I know equity is of course something which is extremely important because we will not be able to achieve, you know, to be ready if we have differences between us. So we need basic to make sure that all EU citizens will be treated in the same manner wherever they will be. But the question of solidarity is, of course, extremely important. And again, if you look at the current crisis, there was a lot, and there still are, there is still a lot of solidarity between member states, between all players. You know, everybody has been solid. I didn't see any fight between the member states, for instance, on you know who should get the vaccines and so on. There was a consensus between the member states. And finally, the two key as a word being uh, resilience and collaboration are clear. You know, we need to be more resilient in Europe. It doesn't mean closing the borders to the rest of the world. We need to be realistic, but simply we need to build enough resilience in Europe to be able to face your new crisis. And how do we do it? By collaborating together, working together. This is a key, uh, this is a way to do it. So equity, equity seems to be the nice word. I fully agree with this. You know, we want an equitable society. We want it to be equitable for all our citizens. And that's exactly what we need also for the future. Thank you very much, Pierre. And again, invitation to all our participants. I saw we have actually crossed the frontier of 100 participants now. Uh, you're more than welcome to still uh, participate also in the word cloud. The word cloud is open. And with this, I would like now to hand over to Barbara Castians, the deputy director uh, from our research directorate general in the European Commission to share her views on what is the role of research and innovation in pandemic preparedness, and also looking at the common strategic EU research and innovation agenda, um, which you are currently building. How would this be achieved? So Barbara, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Yes, as you all know, to, to control and respond to pandemics such as to COVID-19, uh, there are knowledge gaps that need to be addressed. Uh, in various fields and uh, in a wide range of research from basic science to clinical science and public health science studies. So what uh, the COVID-19 pandemic also demonstrated is that research and innovation have played an important role because it is our investment in uh, the new groundbreaking technologies developed over many years 
that we were able to uh, support the development of the new mRNA vaccine, this time used uh, for uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus, as well as the diagnostic test. And uh, what I wanted to highlight is that when we're focusing now on medical countermeasures, whether it's vaccines or therapeutics, to advance the development of these new or adapted vaccines and treatment candidates, clinical trials are essential. And what we witnessed in this pandemic, in the early stages of the pandemic, that there were many small scale clinical trials uh, going on, but the, the, these trials were so small that they didn't yield significant results. And therefore this highlighted the importance to join forces in setting up uh, clinical trials and that is why we established this European network for COVID-19 therapeutics and one for vaccines. So a network of trial sites across Europe and beyond to address the need for new therapeutics for COVID and uh, vaccines. So while the investments in these clinical trial networks uh, have been important, are important, we also see them as a key investment for future pandemic preparedness because by building the network, further developing the network, adding more sites, talking to national and regional authorities, we will gather the uh, expertise and the capacity to uh, better address uh, a new outbreak when it will come, because as Pierre said, we don't know when it will come, but we are sure that it will come. But it's also important uh, when we're talking about research uh, and innovation, but certainly when we focus on a timely contribution, we need an infrastructure that allows for sharing data. We need to make sense of a wealth of data that is out there, epidemiological data, data related to the pathogens. And that's why we invested in setting up this European COVID-19 data platform. This is a platform that allows in a safe and secure way to share data and analyze them. So we see that these investments for COVID-19 uh, focused are also investment for better preparedness and they will contribute to building the HERA that Pierre just spoke about. And uh, Pierre also highlighted two, two phases, the, the preparedness phase and the, the crisis phase. Well, in terms of the research, during the preparedness phase, we will support research and innovation for the development of new technologies and the further building, as I already mentioned, on these EU-wide clinical trials networks we have set up. During the crisis phase, uh, HERA will allow the activation of emergency research and innovation plans and uh, that we will develop together with the member states. And when referring to the member states, I wanted to also inform you that we are developing together with the member states, the European Research and Innovation Partnership on Pandemic Preparedness. And this is in line with the joint opinion on improving pandemic preparedness and management. And what is the objective of this research and innovation partnership? It's to improve the union's preparedness to prevent, predict, and respond to epidemics. And starting by developing a joint strategic research agenda. When I refer to joint, it is uh, with uh, the member states and build, to build a European research area in pandemic preparedness. So this partnership will be also an important contributor to HERA because the Member States and the European Commission will engage to exchange scientific knowledge, provide new strategies for public health reforms. So collaboration and cooperation between research, different research stakeholders has demonstrated to be important and key even in tackling COVID-19. So we want to continue doing this by building this partnership on dynamic preparedness. Um, and to, to end my presentation, investment in preparedness research rapidly pay off when weighed against the actual costs, human and economic, of responding to a crisis. Thank you very much, Barbara, for spelling out the different tools that uh, the Research Innovation Directorate has put at the disposal of member states during the COVID crisis and also explaining the research and innovation partnership, which is uh, currently set up. And that is, as you said, also an important piece of the HERA. Um, if we could please go back to our word cloud, let's see um, how it is building. And maybe Barbara, you would also have an immediate reaction to it. 
Yes, equity remains at the center, uh, and, and this is indeed uh, very important to, to ensure equitable access to uh, and development of uh, medical countermeasures. But I, I think, as Pierre mentioned, solidarity is an important uh, feature, but coordination and collaboration, when I'm referring to uh, the, more, the research dimension of the pandemic response, is, has shown to be extremely important because if we leave data sets standalone in a small region or in a big country without gathering these data and making sense of them, without having the capacity to conduct large scale clinical trials, we lose out in the end. And so this coordination and collaboration with its, its coordination and collaboration, not only between researchers, because that is important, but also between public health authorities. And uh, yes, I, I think that is an important. And, and by collaboration, coordination, uh, we will also be uh, more resilient. We will build the resilience of, of, of Europe and, and, and the world, basically. I will leave it at that. Thank you very much, Barbara. And it's great to see that it's uh, changing. So again, a word of encouragement to our participants to please still participate to build our word cloud here. That's working very nicely. Thank you so much for that. And um, then I will hand over now to our next speaker. It's my pleasure to uh, introduce to you Dr. Andrea Amon, the director of the European Center for Disease Prevention and Control in Stockholm. And we have invited her to speak, obviously, about the new mandate of ECDC, um, what, what are the key points there, and also what will make in the mandate and when it's there, what will make the difference, what will be different now in a year, and also how HERA and ECDC would be complementing each other. So Andrea, you have the floor now. Yeah, thank you very much, Ingrid, and uh, good morning to my co-panelists and also to the audience. I'm glad that so many people are attending this session, actually. Uh, yeah, thank you for, for the questions, and I, I think also thank you for the proposal. Uh, I think we were um, are quite pleased last year when you put forward the proposal, and I'm referring now mainly to uh, the uh, proposal by the Commission and to elements that actually all three uh, institutions have taken up in their proposals. Um, because uh, these um, uh, uh, suggestions to strengthen ECDC's mandate and position uh, are based on really lessons that we see uh, now coming out of the of the of the pandemic and uh, in terms of uh, main um, uh, points that uh, uh, i see in our new mandate is uh, the um, uh, reinforcing a surveillance system through digitalization. It is uh, the uh, preparedness and response uh, um, uh, activities that uh, should, on the one hand, uh, look at the EU level, but also support the member states in the review of their plans and then also in strengthening uh, what the uh, as 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 uh, uh, in the areas where there has been uh, seen um, uh, need for improvement, um, we have with this proposal a stronger and more explicit mandate to work with countries outside of the EU. We are doing this already, but now it's much more explicit that uh, ECDC should engage uh, with countries, uh, of course, in the uh, 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 neighborhood of the e uh, EU, uh, in uh, enlargement countries, neighborhood partnership countries, but also uh, around the globe. And that is uh, also a bit uh, more detailed in terms of uh, the um, uh, support for preparedness uh, um, uh, activities in third countries. Um, and I come back so, uh, to how, how we would do this. Um, we have a mandate uh, to uh, setting up together with the colleagues in EMA uh, uh, a new platform for monitoring EU vaccine um, uh, safety and effectiveness, where EMA colleagues do the safety, we do the uh, uh, effectiveness, and create a EU health task force. 
um, mainly for supporting the member states, but then also for support in uh, in uh, third countries. And last, um, uh, that is uh, is uh, as a new element in the in the proposal is uh, to uh, establish and coordinate a network of EU reference laboratories. And um, uh, uh, one aspect I would like to highlight is that we uh, see also a need to um, not reinforce only modeling and forecasting, but also to grow more interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary with um, uh, more behavioral science and health economics. So, um, and that is um, actually on top of what we are doing, because of course we are already working with very important health issues like uh, antimicrobial resistance and vaccination coverage, other than COVID in the countries and uh, helping the countries to monitor the uh, sustainable development goal um, uh, for infectious diseases and so forth. So that we will of course continue. Now, when I look a bit in the future, what uh, we are immediately now uh, looking at is that the implementation of this mandate will require from us um, a different way of working with the member states. I think uh, we are already working with member states, we have structures in place, how we do the exchange and the consultations, but I believe in order to really implement this uh, mandate, we need to find a different way, and that is what we're exploring already now. Uh, how we can uh, further elicit um, uh, the needs from the countries, but also analyze the situation in the countries better to give them some uh, advice and guidance where, uh, from our point of view, a strengthening would be most beneficial. Uh, now, the second question is about HERA. Uh, and here, um, uh, as Pierre said, I mean, it's very new. Um, uh, there are um, uh, tasks for HERA, tasks for ECDC, and we will have to work out how to divide the work, especially uh, uh, regarding the task where uh, we also have um, uh, 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 activities, which is mainly on the threat assessment, the, the forecasting and the modeling. And the aim is really to uh, not only uh, go for complementarity, but if possible, in my view, for synergy, so that we put the forces together and create something uh, that uh, neither institution would be able to do alone. So that is something that we that we will embark now. Uh, ECDC is a part of the HERA board. So um, as soon as this uh, HERA board takes up their, their uh, work and their meetings, uh, we will be part of this from the beginning. So we have this, we have uh, already um, um, uh, uh, given our nomination and uh, then it's, um, uh, I hope it will go its way. But there is another partner, very recent partner that we need to interact with. And that is the recent WHO hub for pandemic and epidemic intelligence in Berlin. Because that is also an area where we have uh, quite strong activities since and lo uh, a lot of experience. So we will also interact with this hub in a way that uh, we can uh, come to synergies and support the also the worldwide um, um, uh, uh, scope of this of uh, of this hub. So I think there are a lot of uh, uh, elements that will that will um, expand our scope, even uh, if the, the core mandate still is infectious diseases, but our scope in many uh, aspects will be widened in the future. Thank you very much, Andrea, for giving a short overview to the audience also on the key aspect of the mandate. You mentioned the reinforcing of the surveillance through digitization, but also the very important support to member states in reviewing and also strengthening their preparedness plans, and also a strengthened role as ECDC and as a part of Team Europe that should be a responsible global player in work with the third countries, and obviously your new 
um, collaboration and also synergy. I think that's a very important uh, to stress it with HERA and then also with the WHO Berlin Hub. Thank you very much for that. I also would like to invite you to have a quick look and a reaction to our word cloud. Let's see if there are any changes. And let's see if more people have been contributing because we have more than 100 attendees. So don't be shy, express your views in the word cloud. Andrea, I hand back over to you. Yeah, I mean, uh, as, as said, uh, was said before, I think equity is a very important element and aspect as a result of all the all the efforts. Uh, so I think every, uh, equity should be an aim that we that we have in all our activities. For uh, us, as I said, uh, collaboration and coordination uh, are really extremely important elements because especially in a situation as an agency that can't tell anybody what they should do, I think we have to work with uh, collaboration and coordination um, uh, with the member states, but also with our uh, colleagues in the Centers for Disease Prevention and Control worldwide, uh, with the colleagues in WHO, uh, and of course, uh, the colleagues in the Commission, uh, in DG Sante and in, the, in other uh, DGs, as we have now uh, seen during this pandemic. And Two agencies like EMA, but we have now really also widened our collaborative scope here. So that for me are really two very uh, important uh, elements. I can say that I believe that solidarity is uh, also a uh, uh, um, from the experience of the past two years, a very important element uh, because I think countries need to help each other. Uh, we have countries that are far advanced in certain uh, technologies, uh, methods that uh, can help others and they're willing to do this. So uh, we see ourselves also as a broker here. And I think the element is not very highlighted here, but for, what for me is very important is the trust. I think trust is something that is so, so um uh, essential underpinning all the work that we do, trust in what we put out, trust in the science, in the guidance that we put out, but also trust in the um, uh, uh, the mutual interactions and the dialogue. So uh, that would be my take on this. Thank you very much, Andrea, also for, for your reaction to our still changing word cloud, so it is still open. We will leave it open during the next intervention still for the participants to uh, contribute with the word. And as a last speaker for this first round, um, before we check how the newsroom is doing, I have now the pleasure to invite Ima Cook, the director of the European Medicines Agency. And we have also asked her to please look at the new mandate um, what are the key points there? What will be different in one year from now? And also, is EMA and HERA also going to collaborate or maybe work in synergies, as Andrea puts it? So many thanks for being here, Ima. I'm handing over to you. Thank you very much, Ingrid. And indeed, it's a pleasure to be here and good morning to everybody. Um, I, I would just like to echo Pierre's words at the beginning and just to say that we should be proud as Europe we should be proud. I personally am really proud of the EMA and the fact that within 15 months of the start of a pandemic we've got four effective vaccines authorized. Now uh, coming up to, to uh, two years where we have also uh, five more in active uh, review. Um, we've managed the shortage situation. We're not seeing more shortages. Um, and we have a number of uh, immunomodulators and antivirals under review. So we're, we, are, uh, we have done huge work uh, together as Team Europe um, uh, in terms of what was within our responsibility and in collaboration with the other partners that you've heard from today. So uh, what I would like to talk about now uh, in, in direct response to Ingrid's question are the, the new roles that the, man, the extended mandate of the EMA gives us. And effectively, there are four streams here. 
um, a, a very extensive new role on shortages. And I'll talk a little bit about what we did uh, during uh, the existing uh, mandate, but not only shortages of medicines, but shortages of medical devices, because this is completely new for us. Uh, we've also, uh, our, the mandate strengthens our, our uh, scientific support in uh, crisis situations, um, and again, builds on what we've done during the current pandemic. And it, we, we were also given a new role in terms of um, medical device expert panels. But I think the key message really is that the current pa pandemic has demonstrated that if we have coordinated EU level action, we can benefit the whole of the European Union. Um, but we also have seen some vulnerabilities and some limitations in uh, regulations, preparedness and response tools. And the extended mandate for us seeks to address uh, these and also helps us to strengthen uh, EU preparedness for crisis situations and response. I think the key role that we, we have in providing scientific advice to developers, including on clinical trial protocols, which is very, very important, can help speed up clinical trial approval in the EU during public health emergencies. And the, the notion that we've used now in the context of the current emergency on, on rolling reviews, so uh, looking at packages of evidence as they become available, has also helped our agility and helped us to speed up regulatory assessments. Um, of course, this is an advisory role. The, the role on clinical trials is, is advisory. Member states will retain the primary competence for the authorization of uh, clinical trials. But I think the fact that the Commission has recommended uh, these arrangements be put into the legislation is really an acknowledgement that the initiatives that EMA took in the context of the current pandemic uh, really were, were valuable as a response to the current crisis. So we had no role on shortages um, in the current pandemic, and, and yet it became very clear that there was a need for a coordinated European activity here. And we quickly set up a, um, a, a task force to look at this. We also um, set up um, a single point of contact network between the member states and uh, the, the industry, which really helped us to manage the shortages at the beginning of the crisis, mainly in ICU situations. But as we moved on, um, uh, shortages of uh, treatments, um, of COVID treatments, um, that again, we have to make sure we don't let happen again. I think the other issue, the other area where we really came into our own was uh, with the establishment of our COVID-19 EMA pandemic task force, because this really helped us to move to a much more agile uh, uh, review of the uh, uh, medicines and uh, products that, uh, and vaccines that were uh, coming to us at, at a very early stage. Now, moving to the new mandate then translates these activities that we've done uh, into really concrete uh, new roles for the agency. But I would come back to uh, what Andrea spoke about in terms of the coordination of vaccine effectiveness and safety monitoring st studies, because this is something that, that we've already started to do in the context of this pandemic. But this uh, safety platform is, again, something that we need to reinforce because we need to be very, very reactive. We need to be able to anticipate the questions and then get answers to them as quickly as possible. And uh, speaking of uh, trying to get answers, we need to exploit real world evidence. And so part of what we see in the mandate is also um, the establishment of our uh, data analytics and real world in, interrogation network um, uh, 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 work that we have uh, that will help us to uh, get uh, timely evidence from real world healthcare care databases across the EU. Now, I want to acknowledge the very, very important role of the network of European agencies and the Commission and the other 
um, uh, uh, agencies, European agencies that we work together, because I think without this coordination, we really wouldn't be able to achieve what, what, we, what we have done. And the mandate acknowledges the need for this coordination and the need for us to continue to work, work in this area. I think we, we really see the need for us to enhance coordination, to help to review emergent scientific data, but also to uh, uh, coordinate the appropriate regulatory response across member states. Um, and this helped, has helped us to manage situations such as export restrictions and other measures which really could have impacted um, the solidarity principle and the functioning of the internal market. Um, with respect to our contribution to HERA, well, first of all, we very much welcome HERA. We, we, we think that this is an important EU initiative um, and we, we see it as synergistic and complementary to what we're doing. But we have a, a big role to play here because we can provide expertise on a lot of elements of preparedness planning and crisis management. In fact, one of the reasons that we were able to set up um, our task force so quickly was because we had an existing health threat plan, which we had created following the H1N1 pandemic. So we need to continue to promote this coordination, drawing on our experience and including the coordination with member states, but also with our international partners, because again, what we've seen from this pandemic is we need to work even more closely with international regulators across the world, and we need to avoid duplication of work so that we are mo more effective. We see that the work that we can do um, through the horizon scanning work that we do, uh, through the support to the need for R&D, um, to look at what, what type of medicines and vaccines are relevant in a crisis, uh, will be really reinforced through the, uh, it, uh, the structures of our extended mandate. And we see that HERA has a, has, will be complementary because it, it has the mandate to work on areas such as production capacities, stockpiling, deployment, areas where we don't have a mandate as such, but where we can contribute from our experience with working with manufacturers with knowledge about uh, the vaccines and medicines. And as Andrea said, we're very much looking forward to helping to build the strategic work plan of HERA, and we will uh, be participating in the HERA board, which will take place later this week. So we're really excited to see these uh, proposals going through um, uh, Parliament and Council at the moment. Uh, the work on our extended mandate has been going very, very well uh, through the Portuguese presidency and now through the Slovenian presidency. Um, we really hope that uh, uh, this package altogether will help Europe be um, uh, much more coordinated and prepared in the context of any crisis uh, that that would present itself to us. Thank you very much, Ima, for your intervention um, and also for the encouraging words at the beginning that we did uh, a huge work together. And as you said, you were part with it with the vaccines and also looking at the possible uh, COVID-19 therapeutics for the moment. And also the work you are planning to do with HERA in the, the, the coming months and uh, being part of the HERA board. Thank you very much for that. And let's have a last look at our cloud. And I would then also invite Ima to see, oh yeah, there has changed a little bit. I think more words have been added now that participants are still um, coming in. So Ima, back to you. Any I, first thoughts when you see that word cloud? I've been looking at it as it's been um, uh, uh, changing and I've, I've picked out a couple of words that I, I think are key to our ambitions and, um, and reflections. And I, I, here I would, would point to what I call the four C's. So we have coordination, we've got collaboration, we've got communication, 
Um, and um, um, oh my, my goodness, I've lost one. Uh, <laughs> I've lost one of my four C's, but it was there. I know it was. Um, uh, uh, but I wanted to to focus on the transparency bit because that really underpins our communication activities. And one of the things we've learned in the context of today's pandemic is you can never be too uh, you can never be too transparent. And communication about what we're doing is key. So even though it's not the biggest word on the word cloud, I'd like to focus on transparency as a, as a tool to help us with communication, coordination and collaboration. Thank you very much, Ima. We will now close uh, the possibility to participate in the work cloud. So this is the, the final one, I would suggest. Um, unless when somebody has clicked in the last five seconds, so thank you again very much to our audience for your active participation here. And I would like to quickly switch to Isabel to give us a short update how we are doing in the newsroom, just one minute to, to see about the activities there. So Isabel, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Ingrid. So we have just reached our peak of 128 participants. There has been some movement in Twitter, but not much, uh, mainly about the transparency, accountability uh, issues, the, the voice of the patients. And regarding the questions, uh, we have uh, 12 questions active. One has already been answered by, by Barbara. And they are around mainly the collaboration uh, between the HERA and WHO, collaboration between HERA and WHO and uh, ECDC, the partners, uh, partnership with the medical device industry, with uh, the non-medical measures, uh, also a reflection that the response uh, seems to be more addressed than the preparedness in the, in the HERA. So what uh, are we planning to do to, to support the preparedness work? And, and what, uh, how much funding will be dedicated to the to the pipeline uh, to fill in the the pipeline uh, collaboration with Barda? Uh, what about other professions that are not the uh, epidemiologists? Uh, and uh, what uh, will be offered by the ECDC EU Health Task Force? So those are this is a, a flavor of the questions that are in the on the pipeline, and that uh, I, I will uh, prepare the order by the, the end of the session if we have the time that the participants could answer. Thank you very much, Ingrid. Thank you very much, Isabel, for this flavor of the lively discussion also in the newsroom. I'm glad to hear that participants also are tweeting about this session. So please uh, keep this going, spread the message. And it's obviously reassuring to see that we have uh, now 127 participants, which is also uh, very good news. So after this little excursion to the chat room, I am now very pleased to give the floor to Moitza Gobic. She is the head of Division of Disease and Injury Prevention in the Public Health Directorate of the Slovenian Ministry of Health. Slovenia obviously having the presidency right now. We are looking to hear from Moitza what steps are they taking in Slovenia to push the European policy in the political arena in terms of preparedness. Also, any stories, any best practices you would like to share from your country, from the national um, level, any lessons learned? Are you already adapting your preparedness plan? And any possible thoughts you would like to share with us on HERA would also be very welcome. So thank you very much again, Moita, for being here. The floor is yours. Uh, good morning to my distinguished co-panelists and to you, Ingrid, and also for the audience. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to share with you the view of and aspirations of Slovenian presidency regarding the future of health stress preparedness in EU. We operate in a moment in time very much marked by the pandemic, which will be remembered for generation. And COVID-19 pandemic has really had a huge implication on health society and the economy. And we were reminded that the health is the foundation of a functioning society. We have, we were, we have learned lessons and we must capture the momentum to improve our preparedness and response to be better prepared for the next crisis. 
We must ensure that response systems are functional long before emergency strike on national and on EU level. And all hazards emergency prevention and preparedness activities are prerequisite for timely and comprehensive response. We need to improve and digitalize health information system for surveillance for immediate and robust action. And timely and complete data will enable the evidence-based policy making. So we need strong and competent ECDC. During the pandemic, we encountered difficulties in ensuring monitoring on needs, manufacturing, procurement, and equitable distribution of key medical countermeasures. So we have been faced with vulnerabilities in global supply chain and a sufficient oversight of manufacturing capacities and research priorities in the EU. In responding to this situation, Commission has prepared TRIO package, which include regulation on ECDC, on EMA, and on cross-border health threat to health. And just recently, the proposal for Council Regulation on Health Emergency Preparedness and Response Authority, HERA, has been presented. So the Slovenian presidency will, given the urgency of the member states and also European Commission, aspire to you know, negotiate and hopefully conclude all four regulations. Intensive negotiation regarding EMA file with the European Parliament is already taking place, what has been already said by the director of EMA. And on 23rd of July, we achieved a success in adopting general approach in the Council on regulation on establishing is the, the uh, establishing a new expanded mandate of ECDC and a new upgraded regulation on serious cross-border health threat to health. And negotiations with the European Parliament is the next step. So we see the interlinkage of so-called TRIO package with new proposed HERA regulation. Therefore, we have to ensure the consistency between the files. Any overlapping must be avoided and synergies are what we expect. It's important that member states are closely involved in uh, the governance of HERA from the onset of functionings, functioning, and we need a little bit more clarity on financing uh, with regard to HERA. And it's clear that close cooperation between member states and European Commission is very much needed to make HERA a reality. To conclude, we need better coordination, more exchange of relevant data, good planning, and capable EU bodies to keep citizens safe and make the EU more resilient for and when the next health emergency strikes. And from the standpoint of the presidency, I can also say that regardless of all the work, we intend to put in the negotiation processes which are taking place just now, we will need a lot of political will and support from member states, commission and parliament to conclude or to achieve the good progress on important legislative files which are on the table just right now. But we are convinced that when these files will be adopted, we will be much closer to strong European health union, which will be um, in favor of what we all strive for our citizens. Thank you. Thank you very much, Moisa, for sharing the EU presidency uh, view and uh, for confirming your dedication to conclude all the four regulations by the end of the, the year, that is uh, a, a challenge. We, we all know this for uh, proposals at, at the same time, but uh, thank you again for, for your dedication and for and highlighting also the need of collaboration between member states and the European Commission in this field. So thank you so much. And with this now, we take a look into the future. 
Our last panelist this morning is Anton Schwörer, the head of international cooperation in the French crisis response team located in the French Ministry of Solidarity and Health. I'm very pleased to, uh, that Antoine could find the time to join us this morning. So I would now hand over to you to share with you some views in terms of preparedness plans um, and in, in the, for the future presidency of the French coming up in January. Yes, hello everyone. I hope you, you are me clear. Um, on the, on the first point, on the next uh, and the French presidency of European Union, I think it's um, it's very important for France, but it's it will be also a very specific moment and special uh, one moment because we will have a French presidential election during the, the French uh, presidency of uh, European Union. It will be a, a challenge for, for us to to to. To, to face to the to the two uh, the two uh, the two events, but the the official priority of the French presidency will be uh, uh, defined uh, by President Macron in December this year. Uh, as uh, said uh, my uh, colleague, my Slovenian colleague, uh, perhaps we could have, but uh, I think the the, the Slovenian presidency um, worked very well on this topic. We could have to to finalize uh, several legislative work like uh, health security package, email mandate, ECDC and draft regulation, and perhaps um, legislative proposal on ERA and uh, legislative proposal on the European health data area. On the question of the preparedness at the national level, uh, we have in France uh, several uh, preparedness plan, like a uh, plan in case of uh, nuclear incidents, smallpox uh, disease, Ebola, pandemic, CBRN, and of course, no uh, COVID plan. This plan and the coordination of the of the of the update of, the, uh, of this plan are, are made by the General Secretary for National Defense in France. It's the Department of the Prime Minister. Uh, and the SGDSN is the is acronym in French, are in charge to coordinate the different sectors because we have a lot of different sectors, not only health, but also uh, for all the topic uh, health uh, threat evaluation and assessment. We, we have a link uh, with the security sector. It's very important to, to involve the security, security sector in the preparedness plant. And uh, all these plants are uh, updated after a crisis, after an, uh, an exercise, but also after a possible new evaluation of the trust. But these plants at the national level include uh, already some uh, European aspects, like European coordination for notification, for alert, for, uh, for cooperation uh, with uh, other member states. But we have seen uh, during this crisis uh, that the threats are not stopped at the border, and it's, it's now very important to, see, to think that the regional approach to, to face to, to the new threat. And it's very important for us. We have uh, we have seen during the the, the, the crisis, uh, especially for the for the, the living area at the cross border, it's very difficult and it's not possible to apply and to implement exactly the same measure, especially on the on the travel control during the during the COVID for the for the cross border living area. And, on the era, I think it's it's uh, it's a it's an important step for the uh, European Union. It's uh, France uh, strongly support the, the era, but I think it's very important also that the whole member state uh, and the role of the member state uh, will be associated very uh, closely in the era uh, activity, but also in the era uh, era governance. It's uh, very important in peace time, but also in, in peace time uh, because. Uh, it's the, the, the member states have no the, the experiences of the preparedness uh, planning and threat assessment, uh, especially. And it's also a, a kind of challenge for member states because the member states need to have uh, adequate uh, structure at the national level to be able to, to dialogue and to, to speak with ERA because it's involved, it involves a lot of, uh, of sector, it's a cross sectoral subject. And uh, in France, uh, some sectors like health or other sectors are very uh, useful, used to work with the European agency with, in the European context, but uh, some sectors are less familiar to work at the European level, like, like uh, the security sector for the 
possible uh, for, for the possible uh, trust uh, evaluation is very important to to be uh, to involve all the sector and that the member states are able to 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 respond and to work closely with uh, with era at the national level and for us i think uh, ERA will be an important step in the preparation and coordination uh, if, ERA, if ERA is, uh, is able to, to better predict the, the, new, the new stress and the new uh, possible events, because the next crisis will not, the, will not be the past crisis. It's why for France, it's very important the analysis of stress and the modeling of specific uh, medical countermeasures associated is crucial and it's uh, For us, it's the, the, new, the first challenge of the new actor like ERA. Uh, and in my opinion, it's uh, perhaps the most difficult part to achieve at the European level because it, it requires a strong intersectoral approach with sector with, uh, that not, uh, not necessarily used to work uh, together on this kind of topic, but better anticipation with allow us to have more time to better adapt to the coming crisis. And uh, it's, uh, if uh, ERA full fire this function, we will uh, respond collectively better to the next crisis. But we have also the topic of uh, medical control measures, stockpile of medical uh, control measures. We have seen during the crisis that uh, we have had uh, some extreme tension on, uh, on, uh, on personal protective equipment uh, with a possible negative impact from member states and citizens on the EU, on the European solidarity. And I think if uh, ERA, work, it will uh, allow us uh, to remove any doubt about the depth and complete European solidarity uh, by preparing uh, together. But also a more specific point, I think ERA can have a, a key role to support the European production capacity, including for specific countermeasures with few market uh, uh, in peacetime, like, like a specific CBRN uh, countermeasure or chemical, uh, chemical uh, uh, countermeasure. It's a very important for us uh, to be better prepared for the next uh, crisis. Over. Thank you very much, Sotou Antoine, for sharing your thoughts. And we took good note that the official priorities would be announced in, in December. Uh, but I understand that we obviously stand ready to work on European legislation. And you also mentioned the European health data space which is also, an, uh, it's not so much in the front right now, but it's extremely important when we speak about um, better surveillance and data exchange. So that would be really a key also uh, piece of legislation to, to tackle in the French presidency. Um, and I think what's also uh, highlighted by you is the intersectoral collaboration, also bringing sectors to the table at national level, but also at EU level, who may have not been so much at the forefront. You mentioned security, for example. I think it's also a very important point. Thank you so much for highlighting this as well. Um, now, I think it's really time to look at the questions from our audience. Uh, we have still more than 100 participants that are with us. That's uh, great. Um, we are a bit behind schedule, but I think we do have time to take several questions um, that have been put in the chat. So I'm handing now back uh, to Isabel for the questions. Thank you very much, Ingrid. I will try uh, to, to put together several of the questions. So the first one will be for Pierre and for Andrea. Uh, will there be a collaboration between HERA and WHO Europe? And also how the network between the ECDC, the HERA and the WHO Intelligence Hub will work? How the member state will uh, respond uh, efficiently to all the different mandates at the same time? Pierre. Thank you very much. First of all, you have to realize ERA will start on the 1st of October. So I don't have an answer, a detailed answer to all the questions, of course. And I don't want also to anticipate and to dictate an answer, because as you say, we need to talk to the member state, we need to talk to ECDC, we need to talk to, to EMA. But one thing which is 100% clear for me is the fact that, you know, ERA will have to work also with the rest of the world, including, of course, WHO, because that's extremely important. And also, I've seen in the question and in the chat, it's clear also that ERA will have to work, you know, with external players like BARDA, We need also to establish contacts also in Africa, because again, and it was uh, said also during this present, those presentations, you know, health is a global issue. 
it's not something which you know is being done uh, on a local issue, not only in Europe. So we need to establish those contacts. If we, if we want to assess threats, it will be on a global dimension. And of course, of course, we will have to discuss with EMA. We will have to discuss with CDC, and we have to try to be organized and to avoid, of course, to be to confront its stakeholders with different uh, requests and different messages. One aspect also I would like to come back and uh, what the French representative said. Of course, member states will be heavily involved in the management of ERA. We do. We are fully aware that if we really want to be effective, we need to maintain the same spirit that existed during the COVID crisis, which is the spirit of cooperation, collaboration, and heavy involvement of member states and uh, and the Commission, and of course the different agencies. One point also on which I would like to insist, because I didn't say it in my presentation, but I believe this is important. We do not want to exclude the European Parliament. So the European Parliament will be associated to the work of ERA. The European Parliament will have a seat at the ERA board. The Parliament, European Parliament will be there also during the crisis mode. So we really want also, because we are fully aware of the importance of the European Parliament, we want the members of the European Parliament also to feel comfortable with, with what ERA is doing, because we know that they are supportive globally with the idea of ERA. So we want also to make sure that they're on board and they're fully helping us to achieve what we need, a better preparedness for Europe. But I would stop here. Andrea, maybe it's for you. I don't know, because Isabel is silent, so maybe it's for you now. Uh, no, no, I mean, I, I, so, so I automatically, okay. So yeah, thanks for the question. Uh, I mean, as I have uh, uh, said in, in my intervention already, uh, and as also Pierre has highlighted, I can only reiterate uh, the, that we have to uh, uh, discuss and work out how we work together uh, so that um, we can bring in our experience, our strength uh, to, to, to the HERA work. Now, regard the, and the same is actually valid for the WHO hub uh, because uh, they uh, start now, um, but they have also um, their director is starting only in November. Uh, so, uh, in that sense, that for me constitutes uh, where we can then actually uh, um, uh, begin to, to uh, discuss how our future work will look like and where we can be of most use for, for the hub and where the hub can be useful for us. So I think uh, um, I, I understand all the questions, uh, but I mean, we, we, the, the institutions have to have to have to start uh, their working and then we can uh, when then we can begin to uh, lay the foundations. Thank you. Thank you. One question uh, for Emma now. Uh, is there um, any way to use the efficient methods of the COVID-19 war to have even slightly improved speed to medicines authorization in peacetime? So thank you very much. And in fact, I saw this question in the chat and I thought uh, it was a very good opportunity to share with you some of the work that we were doing now on lessons learned in the current pandemic. Um, because the rolling review, which has an enabled us to move very quickly in the context of pandemic, has come with associated stresses and challenges uh, that we're really looking at how we um, can improve going forward. So to make the predictability for the member states working on the dossiers to make that better, to have to have a, a, a sort of an end um, in sight so that it, um, we don't duplicate some of the packages. Um, uh, so we, we have certainly seen that, that there, there, there are areas we can work on there. I think the other important uh, thing here is, is to give a clear message that when we have a, a good dossier, we can work very quickly. So what the message really is to industry to make sure not to put in, not to, to present us with premature dossiers, because once we have um, a, um, a complete dossier where, uh, where the, the, the evidence is clear, we can work much quicker. 
But there are elements we will bring into post-pandemic. Uh, we will use rolling reviews for some priorities. We won't use it for everything. Uh, we will work on uh, avoiding premature applications. We will look at how we can do use um, distant um, uh, assessments um, or inspections in part to support uh, some of our activities. And we will continue to work uh, very closely with international regulators. So again, we can synergize and, um, and, uh, and speed up our assessments. Thank you very much. Another question for uh, Andrea on using opportunities or uh, tools that have been developed in the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, the, the pandemic has had an impact on routine immunization. Uh, are you going to develop a similar tool to what uh, you developed uh, for the COVID-19, the tracker of the vaccine, uh, to follow the routine immunization and, and to have an opportunity to increase the coverage of routine immunization? Okay, so um, uh, a vaccine, I mean, the immunization is one of the, the responsibilities, uh, the many responsibilities of the member states. So also here we can support them in their, in their efforts, but uh, we, cannot, uh, we cannot go in and say, well, this is what you have to do. Now, for, we have um, uh, uh, done uh, um, uh, a lot of work for the no normal vaccines uh, in the past years to strengthen and increase the vaccine coverage. We have done a lot of communication um, tools for, for um, uh, healthcare workers uh, to uh, deal with uh, uh, um, uh, patients that have questions parents that have questions. So that is one way that we can do, giving out guidance. We support uh, member states in, in guidance for uh, setting up immunization, um, uh, 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 electronic immunization reg uh, registries. Uh, so that's what, what, what we're doing. Now the tracker is something that we have uh, now uh, established for COVID vaccine, which is in a way unique because I think you do not need such a tool necessarily for uh, the, the routine vaccination. So that is something, but that is something that we can discuss with our uh, contact points in the member states with the NITEX, whether they want to have something like this. I think it's more interesting for new vaccines uh, that are sort of rolled out. Um, and I mean, there will be probably uh, new vaccines. Uh, we, we know that there is a vaccine for respiratory syncytial virus in, in the pipeline. And I think it's more a tool that is for the rollout for new vaccines than for long existing um, uh, 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 vaccines that is there. But I mean, uh, I think it's worthwhile to discuss, uh, um, but that would be my immediate Thank you. Um, so for Pierre, the most popular question on the pool is uh, uh, this statement that the response seems to be more adequately addressed than preparedness. Um, uh, what are you going to do uh, to support the preparedness work and how much funding are you going to dedicate to that? Thank you very much for the question. Of course, it's clear that we need to be prepared and again, uh, as I said, we have several measures on which we really want to, to focus. First, it has been mentioned by Barbara, the question of research and uh, development is extremely important because let's not forget, for instance, if we talk about the mRNA vaccines, yes, they were available very quickly, but why was they available very quickly? Because actually there was research before on those vaccines and the, those research was part, partly funded also by, uh, by the predecessor of Horizon Europe. So, you know, you don't create something new. So research is also prepared for the future is something which is extremely important. Second element, as I said, the question of uh, production capabilities. We believe this idea of having ever warm uh, production capability is important. What do we mean by this? Actually, what we mean by this, is that as a EU we would simply reserve some production capabilities in Europe. And of course, this will be done in a very transparent manner. Let's be very clear. Those production capability, you know, might still be used if we are in a peace time and not necessarily need it uh, uh, because there is no need to have those production capability to be used by ERA. Then when there is a crisis, 
we would be able to activate those production capability and to make sure actually that they would immediately start producing what we need them to produce. This is also, again, a very important response, which I believe is there. Stockpiling has been mentioned. It's also something which is important. Joint procurement, you know, if we talk about uh, what we are doing now, if you look, for instance, as you know, on therapeutics for COVID, we are looking, you know, at some products which are more, I would say, possibly successful against the COVID, uh, we, are, we are trying to establish a, such a list. And of course, MR, or EMA and MR are playing their role in this context. Uh, but we, again, this is a kind of measures which could be you know, taken on board by ERA and where we will have financing. And again, if you look at the finance, as I say, we have a budget potentially, at least we, at the EU level of 30 billion, which, you know, for, uh, for, which means five, year, five billion every year which is not a small amount of budget. And that's something which is quite ambitious. And again, of course, some of the actions will be more visible than others, but we believe all of them will, uh, will be extremely important. And again, the spirit I would like to, to keep again, and I would like to maintain it, is cooperation. We need cooperation. We don't need fights. If we fight between ourselves, we are lost. The only way to be ready and to be prepared for the future crisis is just by cooperating all of us together. Uh, thank you. Um, Ingrid, I think that we have time for two more questions. If this is right, uh, one will be for, for Pierre again and the other one for Antoine. So for Pierre, it's about um, uh, the involvement or the non-involvement of NGOs in the in the era. And also, uh, what about the professions that are not uh, epidemiologists, respiratory specialists or, or others? How, how you will involve or how ERA will involve other professions? You know, again, you, you, we are still in the early phase of ERA. Actually, it's not even officially started because it will start on the 1st of October on Friday. So you're asking me difficult question. Uh, the point is, of course, we are fully aware that you have a diversity of uh, professions, expertise, which is needed. And of course, at this stage, what we really want to do with, with ERA is to have a broad scope of expertise, because we are fully aware that we need to look at different dimensions. And uh, so that's uh, what I would say at this stage. I don't have a definitive answer. My point is we are open. So we're open to, to, to all, you know, all possible uh, specialists and expertise, because that's something which will be extremely important. Again, we don't know what will be the future threat. You know? Nobody knows exactly what will be the future threat. So that's something which is important, and we need to work all together to try to assess those threats. Thank you. And for Antoine, Antoine, the question is about uh, the priorities of the French presidency, and if you will be following or closely linked to the Slovenian priorities, or you will have other priorities. Yes, uh, on the the priority of the uh, of the French presidency of uh, Union uh, European Union, it will be defined by President Macron in December. But uh, I cannot uh, give uh, some detail for the moment, but uh, the, the, the general idea is to say in the same way that the previous, uh, the previous presidency and to perhaps to, to, to finalize some uh, leg legislative work uh, engaged in the previous uh, presidency. Thank you. Uh, do we have time for more questions, Ingrid? Yes, I think you can take one more. Okay, uh, what about the ECDC you helped us for, Andrea? What that we will offer? Um, I think this is also something that we have to still discuss. Uh, we are um, uh, already starting to recruit um, um, uh, colleagues for this. Uh, we have, uh, I mean, they dual a dual task because when there is uh, an outbreak or a pandemic um, and a request from a member state then it would uh, be uh, deployed for 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 support so that is uh, the, the, the 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 response aspect um, there is also a preparedness aspect, and that I think is very important uh, uh, to what I mentioned before, with a different way of working with the countries. Um, we uh, uh, would like to uh, assign um, uh, dedicated people to certain countries so that uh, there is a, this, this closer relationship, the better knowledge about the situation in a country uh, that can then also help and support the, the respective uh, countries in their preparedness efforts. So there is a preparedness role and there's a response role. And the res uh, uh, both roles are mainly directed to the EU countries, but also globally. 
Thank you very much. Thank you very much to all of you. Uh, maybe one last question, may I? Uh, to Moha. Uh, what are uh, the, uh, the, 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 the teaching that uh, you take for, from this presidency and uh, how has been needed to, to develop all the, those uh, proposals, the ECDC, the EMA, the cross-border healthcare in uh, so short time? Uh, thank you for the question. Yeah, it's a really challenge, but as I said, we have to build on moment on, on momentum. We we learned lessons, and we all know that the next crisis will come. We don't know um, how it will look like, but we have to really strengthen the preparedness. And as a presidency, we will do our best to to be fair and negotiate in a transparent way. Uh, all the files and uh, hopefully to be concluded in due time. We will do our best to conclude it uh, during our presidency. If not, our French uh, colleague will, I'm sure, continue and um, conclude it in a really short time. Thank you. Thank you very much. There are still our question but as Pierre has said there is still a lot of incertitude the HERA does not work yet so in the in the next month uh, uh, the question that you have posed uh, that you have made could be answered but now it's uh, maybe a little bit uh, early so Ingrid Thank you very much to Isabel for um, moderating this question and answer session for to the attendees for your active participation and also for to the panelists for answering. So we are about to come to a close to the session and it's now the time for the take home tweets. I would like to invite all the panelists in the same order as they spoke to take the floor very briefly again. So, and to share with you the take home tweet uh, for the audience. So then I would first go to Pierre and invite you for the very brief message to the attendees. Thank you. It's easy. I have repeated it several occasions. You know, we have been su successful because we have been united. If we want to be ready for the next crisis, we need to remain united. Of course, that's not mean changing the competencies and the role of everyone. You know, uh, everybody will. But the message is everybody has a role to play in this, and it's by working together, by helping us each other understanding also of, what, of all, what all of us are doing that will be able to be ready for the next crisis. And if I have only one wish, if unfortunately we have a new crisis in the future, I hope we will be our citizens will be even better protected than they are for the moment. Thank you very much, Pierre. I would like to invite Barbara for to share her take home message. Yes. So the the collaboration and the cooperation between the re different research and public health stakeholder and the trust that has been built in the course of the past months have been key to tackle the COVID-19 pandemic and this is the type of effort that need to be sustained as we build uh, the European Health Union and we prepare to tackle uh, other health risks. Thank you very much, Barbara. Andrea, over to you in Stockholm. Yeah, thank you. So um, we need to learn now the lessons from this pandemic and uh, shore up the health systems to be more resilient in the next uh, few, uh, in the next crisis. Um, I, th strengthening preparedness in the EU, but also globally, should not be seen as a cost. It is an investment because only if we're all prepared, we're all safe and can avoid these negative consequences on the society that we see right now. Thank you so much, Andrea. Then I would hand over to Ima. So I want to build on the message of cooperation and really close cooperation, coordination, collaboration and communication will be key and a cornerstone for delivering crisis preparedness and management for any future health threat. And in this respect, I'm talking about cooperation between HERA, EMA, ECDC, European Medicines Agency, Regulatory Network and the inst institutions within uh, the European Union. 
This current crisis has seen me European medicines regulators emerge even stronger and better prepared for the challenges that, that lie ahead. We are, all, we are stronger together. Thank you very much, Ima. Now we're moving to, to Moisa in Slovenia. Yes, we need to deepen our collaboration also between member states, commission, European parliament. Um, we have to build more resilient health system, uh, which will respond better. And we uh, should not forget that we have been also innovative during the crisis and we, uh, we, we made uh, huge differences and we built up of this innovation to be uh, to better respond, and we should build on this uh, for the sake of the better preparedness for the future. Thank you very much, Moitza. Last but not least, Antoine. Yes, I think uh, solidarity because member said, but also EU citizen must know that uh, they will be uh, never alone during the possible next uh, crisis. Thank you very much again to our panelists. And I know that you have been also in your final messages taking up some of the words which very clearly came out as the keywords in our work cloud, solidarity, collaboration and cooperation. You uh, mentioned again that uh, the lessons learned need to be uh, taken up now to strengthen preparedness at EU and uh, also global level, which is an investment and not a cost. So that we, it's important to collaborate, which Moita also stressed, also Pierre said, member states and also EU institution remain united. Um, also recognizing that everybody has a role to play in no competition, you know, we're working together so that in the end, um, we are also ready to innovate that we see that we are stronger together for the protection of our citizens' health. So that is a really long tweet at the end, you know, <laughs> maybe bringing together a bit what, what you said. Um, I would like to thank again all the panelists for their time this morning. I would like to thank also again the attendees uh, for their, their interest into Isabel for her splendid collaboration in setting up the session. Maybe I, uh, one note to a message from the colleagues of the European Health Forum Gastein that the networking launches are open now in the upcoming break. So if you want to have a virtual coffee break or a virtual lunch break, this is also possible here. So many thanks again. I really hope to see everybody soon again in person and have a good afternoon. Bye bye.